Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our broadcast. Uh, I'm Dr. John Milne. I'm the Senior Vice President for Real Estate uh, Strategy and Operations at uh, Providence St. Joseph Health. And this is an ongoing series uh, from our uh, real estate division, really looking at uh, broader concepts within uh, healthcare and, and again, the healthcare uh, planning environment. And so this is a the first now of a series of, of uh, sessions with our planning team, and we're going to introduce our, the panel here in a, in a moment, but we're going to be continuing to explore a number of topics here in uh, coming broadcasts uh, today and then uh, going forward subsequently around looking at design planning and uh, understanding you know, where the future of healthcare is headed. But just a couple of brief uh, d disclaimers here. Um, I am a physician, but uh, nothing in this uh, broadcast should be seen as uh, giving medical advice. Uh, you should, if you are experiencing any health problems, seek a qualified uh, medical provider to be able to uh, provide you professional uh, uh, insight into your exact medical conditions. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and get started uh, with our uh, with our introductions. So um, I'm just going to allow you guys to introduce yourselves and your role uh, here at, at Providence rather than me trying to, um, trying to introduce you. So I'll start with Michelle. You want to introduce yourself and, and your role here at Providence? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Michelle Bernard. I'm based in Portland, Oregon part of the real estate strategy and operations team. And I support John and the larger team on institutional campus planning. I'm the institutional planning director. And hi, I'm Hillary Altman, a similar role to Michelle in long range capital planning. And I'm in the Seattle office. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Suzanne Schwab, a little bit of a different role. I'm land use and planning director for Providence St. Joseph Health and um, a part of the same team through real estate uh, strategy and operations. Happy to be here this afternoon. Great, and I appreciate all three of you uh, joining me in this conversation this afternoon. And for those of you uh, who are not familiar with uh, Providence, uh, we are a health system uh, that has 53 hospitals now um, across uh, eight states, uh, Alaska, Washington, Montana, Oregon, California, Texas, and New Mexico and really uh, serve a large population across uh, those states. And so as we think about it within the real estate division, our, our focus as we look at each one of those communities is really a much more holistic uh, view of what these communities are. And so we uh, function on what does the built environment look like across each one of those communities? What are the assets that we have in the community and how does it support delivering care and really uh, our tagline of, of developing health in communities? We really focus on that broader uh, look at health across um, all of those uh, communities. And so as we think about it, it really encompasses not just our hospitals and, and our traditional acute care assets that we have in each one of those communities. And in many of those communities, our hospitals are the largest employers. So have a significant impact on the overall economy of an individual uh, community, but also then what are the other buildings that support uh, that those hospitals, whether they're medical office buildings, uh, clinics in various uh, forms, but also uh, our team spend time looking at housing and looking at uh, many of the, the social um, aspects uh, that relate to healthcare and what are the social determinants of health as we try to pull all of those pieces together into a much more comprehensive uh, view. And so we work significantly with local and state municipalities and with, with governments and, there's, and the planning uh, groups Groups there thinking about land use, thinking about broader strategies across uh, the communities and the impact, um, and, and not just uh, through that healthcare lens. And that's why I'm really excited to have uh, uh, this group of experts with me today to be able to kind of talk through some of those issues of you know why planning is important for us at, at Providence and um, you know and how we can partner with developers and architects and city governments and municipalities to be able to really comprehensively come together in partnership to think about what does the built environment look like? How does this platform really for developing health uh, look? And, and you have that broader conversation. So with that, I guess I would you know turn it over to um, uh, to the three of you. Tell me about what is planning? What does it mean when you start getting you know at that very high level before we get into some of the macro pieces of of, of what, what does it mean when you start thinking about uh, a community master plan? And what, is that, what does that look like in the broadest sense? Well, I can go ahead and kick off. I think uh, traditionally for us about five years ago, community master planning was very focused on the hospital campus. And since 
just a couple of years ago, we've really done an immense amount of work organizationally to broaden that lens. And really where we start is through a collaboration of key stakeholders at the table to define the problem of what we're trying to solve. And that encompasses um, preventative care, ambulatory care, the acute care environment, post acute, we're really trying to engage those stakeholders as early as possible in the process to be um, true thought leaders in the vision that we're trying to create for a healthier community. So I think it really starts first with understanding who at the table should be part of the process and then have everybody aligned to, to, the, to the definition of the problem which we're trying to solve. And Suzanne, you do a lot of our work in terms of the relationships with local municipalities and governments and land use and thinking about zoning sorts of, of things. How does, uh, what's the overlap between us as a health system and then the relationship with our local partners in those various communities? And what is, how do we think in the, those broader uh, pieces of shaping communities in that way? Well, John, as you alluded to before, you know, we want to build health in our communities. And um, while there are specific building and zoning regulations, development standards that we have to pay attention to, a lot of my role is just really making those connections and relationships and understanding community needs um, so that as we partner for some of that future growth, we're doing that in tandem um, with our surrounding Maybe it's property owners, maybe it's the um, community that we specifically serve, um, the meaning people, right? Our patients who walk through our doors each day. And then um, also helping our jurisdictions, the cities and counties that we operate in to be a partner in health. Like how can we help them to develop policies that will continue to build health in their communities? How can we um, be a, a sounding board, a liaison, a part of their, their planning processes and um, and that's been also a major a major part of my role. And I guess kind of unpacking that a little bit further, Suzanne, is you you know if you were a, a, a city planner and you know say hey I've got an interest in saying this sounds really great uh, I, I would love to have a really healthy robust community. What does that really mean at a more tactical sort of a level if you know for a city government to think about health and how they should be partnering with a health system? Are there you know, more tangible examples about ways that are effective uh, in doing that? For sure, um, especially the the cities that we, we have facilities in right now, we're a major, a major economic um, engine for them. We're a major employer. And so um, we have a lot of dialogue with them on things like that. But um, I can give you a specific example of a project I'm working on right now. Um, where the, the city where we have one of our facilities is going through a general plan amendment or update, excuse me. And through that process, they're setting their high level priorities, policies and goals for the future of their city. And as I've taught, I've participated in their workshops and talked to their uh, city planner, we've decided that we're gonna help them establish a health zone. And I think this is a huge opportunity for us. We're experts to come to the table to share the knowledge about how we see um, the future of, of health care and um, we can do that you know through looking at um, other models like blue zones um, and also partnering with other places where we've been successful on these sorts of things so um, there's a lot of opportunities for partnerships and then um, Hillary, I guess, and, and at a you know more healthcare specific, healthcare centric uh, level with this, is as we think about hospital planning and and, and the, those at traditional acute care campuses, kind of to help us kind of understand what it what is what it goes into that kind of almost rings that happen. If you think about, you've got right at the center of the core of that hospital, and then you've got obviously buildings that are that are acute uh, around it. But then you know, how do you start layering into that? How do you start getting your arms around what is the need in a particular the community with, with regard to the various types of facilities uh, that go into uh, overall medical community? Yeah, I think it's very different than we would have historically looked at before in a you know straight fee-for-service environment. We would think about the hospital as the center and you know then maybe our ambulatory facilities and everything else is just kind of you know maybe not at the at the priority level. And now when we look at you know, the move towards value, it just doesn't make sense to look at it in that same lens. And so we have to look at our post acute network and, you know, where people are housed and whether that's stable or not, 
And so it's a, kind of the full continuum of care, not just um, the hospital anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, you know, the important thing for, you know, to think about is that, you know, we're continuously as a health system really thinking about what that, you know, how care is delivered, how that ongoing uh, process uh, looks across multiple entities. And so, uh, you know, continuing to evolve our facilities, our design, our planning to be able to meet those uh, those needs is a, is a critical component of, of ultimately uh, effective master planning and designing, you know, how do we, how do we think about what facilities need to be um, in a community. So seeing a question has popped up here in the chat box uh, here, really curious, and, and Michelle, you can probably speak to this uh, directly given some of our, our partnerships that you've been in, uh, in context with. How do we partner with other health systems as we think about our, our hospitals and, and how, do you, how do you interface with different health systems who might have different delivery models that uh, more of a fee-for-service uh, focused uh, entity such as we are oftentimes versus one that maybe is more uh, focused on managed care and, and balancing those uh, processes? I, I think with any type of partnership, I think some of the basic tenets of why you operate, what is your mission, um, how do you provide health to a community? If those are aligned, your partnership is already on a, a pretty solid path for exploration. And so with Providence, I think the fit around um, providing wellness and health to any and all populations, regardless of of gender or race, and and really the the value about making sure that we're caring for the vulnerable and poor is ultimately in a part of our mission. So if we have a partner that resonates with that, we think exploring that in a real way around facility capital asset management and sharing of resources is what really brings true innovation to the table because what we might be strong in in one market, they might be lacking in and we can come together and talk through how we can partner. Um, a lot of times we don't have all the answers in place. And so having a partner at the table to kind of check us on that, I think is really exciting. And it just allows us an opportunity to grow in ways we probably haven't thought of or that we're just kind of already traditionally um, kind of used to doing. So partnerships for us, I think is a really big key to the success for our, for our future. Yeah, I think and you're right in terms of it, and it's a growing part of our future in the sense of continuing to understand that the cost of care delivery uh, is continuing to ex accelerate. You know, the cost of capital and and we are very capital intensive. Uh, you know, big buildings and you know expensive equipment and those sorts of things is difficult for any one system to to do it all. And so I guess I'd be curious uh, for both uh, Michelle and Hillary, you guys have both been doing strategic planning for health systems for a long time, but even before you came to Providence who are in the consulting world, you know, historically in a, a fee for service market, two hospitals would be having an arms race as, you know, we're gonna build the bigger tower or more MRIs or all those sorts of things. How do we take into account, you know, what our competitors are doing in a market? How do we think about comprehensively what a community needs in a market versus just saying, how do I go and win more uh, market share and, and out compete, um, you know, for, for somebody so that we can actually look at community level cost of care and total cost of care, as opposed to just simply, uh, how do I gain market share? And how's that changed over the course of your careers? Yeah, I think on a very basic level, we try to ensure we're not duplicating services that the community already has access to. So why why would we spend money um, to offer something when the community already has access to it? Um, so I think you know it's just it's just a very different lens that we're looking at as far as the competitive nature. I mean, obviously we want to know. Uh, you know, we do so want to understand market share, but to Michelle's point about partnering in different ways, it's just it's just a very different environment today. And I think our I think our problems aren't completely unique to ourselves. I think yeah. these other institutions and organizations are struggling just as much to provide quality care at scale. And so I think they're they're looking for that partnership just as much as we are. And I think too, certificate of need states, you know, also kind of a light for us how much is out there and how much activity, healthcare activity is out there and do we need to add to that or is it really a partnership by which we just improve upon it? Mm -hmm. 
And I think you know one of the other uh, you know questions that as we think about this, um, you know, to your point, you know, I think partnerships are you know it's, they've existed, but it really has changed the flavor really in the last number of years about uh, for us, particularly as an institution, in, in uh, around that strategy. And part of that is around some of the bigger social questions that we can't tackle uh, on our own, such as homelessness and housing. And we're, we're looking at this with uh, you know Catholic charities in many of our communities and and other uh, you know strategic partners. Uh, uh, across a coalition, you want to talk about uh, housing and homelessness in particular, and some of the initiatives that uh, the three of you have been participating in around that. Well, I, I can start on that one, John, and then uh, Hillary and Michelle are welcome to jump in too. I mean, first and foremost, we have a lot of services that help with um, those experiencing homelessness um, right in the hospital. I know. Um, here in California where I'm at, we have a homeless navigators program. I know Oregon has a very similar program, a little different. Uh, speaking, you know, my in my role as, a, as you know, land use experts, really, how can we start then making um, connections with the city and partners in the community then to offer some of those long-term solutions? You know, um, some supportive housing, um, being able to find uh, long-term support that people will, and making sure then for the future, the way, way future, um, when, we're, when we're looking at those plans that are potentially, you know, 30 years out, 20 years out, um, how do we accommodate to build more of it? Yeah, I think, that, you know, it's, it's interesting to sit and look at, you know, the unique partnerships uh, that exist. And so uh, we have um, a, a, a robust, uh, uh, housing uh, and, and you know supportive care uh, uh, network where we we have a number of, of uh, facilities that are you know bringing on online opportunities for uh, some of those most poor and vulnerable uh, individuals within our communities to be able to uh, ha have those supportive housing resources that are there we're converting hotels into um, uh, uh, into the long-term supportive housing uh, scenarios uh, partnerships obviously with with, uh, with local municipalities around there is, is becoming an increasing uh, it's, it's been a part of our mission for a long time but I think the the scope of what what that looks like as we think about housing is, is even even broader and so uh, Tim Z within our organization uh, is you know leading many of those uh, uh, those uh, issues and, and Carrie Burchell Christensen and our team also uh, there uh, are really resources as we you know again partner in those uh, broader community sorts of, um, of venues. So a uh, question that's coming back in from the, um, uh, from the chat screen here. I appreciate uh, those of you who are posting questions uh, that were able to feed back to us and respond to. One of the things was question about COVID-19 and how has that impacted what our, our thinking about planning, you know, from, from, a, from a strategy and from a strategic plan, you know, thoughts, uh, um, has that changed for, uh, as you're looking at what we uh, plan for, uh, given that we're still in the midst of a pandemic? How has that changed your thinking about master planning? Yeah, it's, I mean, just from a very fundamental question about what services do we offer? Where should they be located? How big should they be? What can we afford? Um, it, it's just fundamentally changed everything that we do, and particularly just in basic forecasting of like what what services are we going to offer? We never would have, you know, projected the need for all of the beds for COVID patients and the way that we were transitioning how care was delivered in the home. So it's very hard to predict what type of care is gonna be delivered in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And I think COVID has really just forced us to um, be more adaptable and to, um, to just to really think about our long-term vision in a very different way. I also think just the impact of how virtual we all are, look at us today across yeah. multiple geographies, has really put an importance on the fact that healthcare can be delivered virtually and it is being delivered virtually. So it just gives us the confidence as we think through different care models that it is actually closer in our grasp than we might have thought of before COVID. And I think that is exciting as we really about the hospital of the future and and what does that really mean for our patients and ourselves and, and those that we love because I do believe there's a lot of potential for us to not have to invest in in the built environment because of how technology has created created a different path for us 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the other piece to it for us is um, I describe this uh, sometimes is a 9-11 type moment for healthcare in the sense that, um, you know, it wasn't that terrorism didn't exist before 9-11, but I think a lot of people in this uh, in the United States kind of woke up to the reality of this can really hit us at home. And so, uh, you know, I'm an emergency physician uh, by background and training. And so my entire career, we've been aware of, you know, the, the potential impact of infectious disease, whether it was Ebola or SARS or MERS or any of these other sorts of uh, potential viral uh, infections that uh, were there that you know we always knew had the potential to become pandemic and we kind of in the back of our mind worried about it but had never really truly seen it in the course of uh, um, our careers and so as we think about this now there's I think there's an awakening to okay this really is real and it is is here and and are we going to think about the way that various uh, facilities are designed for us going forward in terms of how do we flex to be ready for a pandemic uh, in the future of this if this does happen? Uh, how do we think about air handlers? How do we think about you know the, the physical design of our spaces is going to change going forward? Hard to say yet uh, exactly how that's going to change. I, it, uh, what are the long-term impact? Long-term. Uh, uh, pieces that we've put into place that are going to affect our, our design and planning going forward. I think we're still too early to know uh, with that. But to say that it's going to go back to being exactly the way it was before, I think is uh, is a little bit of a, of a naive process. So pivoting a little bit in this conversation, going back to one of the Facebook questions that's popped up here. Um, Suzanne, you do a lot of our um, you know, kind of analytics work around, you know, drive times and geographies and other sorts of, of pieces. How do you see the difference between, you know, planning as you look at it in, a, in an urban setting versus a rural setting? Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, care delivery, you know, Michelle and Hillary into those two different pieces. We have critical access hospitals in our portfolio in very small rural communities. And we have, you know, large uh, hospitals in urban areas that are providing tertiary and quaternary level care. As we think through master planning and, and standards of excellence and, and hub and spoke type designs, how do, how do all of those factors uh, fit into it with regard to the geography? Well, this is really where all three of us work very closely together because there are all of those different data points, as you're starting to mention, John, that, that we need to consider, you know, the changing demographics as populations are shifting. Are we looking at rural versus urban area and um, access? You know, are people able to take transit to get there? Are they having to drive longer distances? And as we've also changed our model of delivery, having more ambulatory spaces closer to where our patients are, those are the types of metrics we're using to identify where those ambulatory, uh, meaning medical office buildings or urgent cares or um, on-demand care, as we sometimes refer to it, should be located because we want that um, to be data-driven and we want to make sure that we're serving our patients and our populations. And we use a variety of tools to do that. I, uh, always touting that a map is and a, and a picture, right? It's it's worth a, a thousand words. So, Michelle, Suzanne's in, yeah, Suzanne's incredible with our maps. So thank you, Suzanne, for for the for doing this. Um, I think too, one of the conversations it's tricky with rural and urban settings because the ability for us to provide the competency and scale consistently in those rural markets can be challenging with retaining providers and investing in the technology needed, and so. Really, as we think through the next couple decades of, can we bring that care to them in a different way than just setting up a shop per se, I think it's really gonna be um, exciting to see how rural, care, rural healthcare changes. Um, and you know, we do talk about you know, the delivery of medications through drones and through all of this really kind of futuristic Jetsons kind of technology, but I think it is actually closer than we all Think it to be and i think it's exciting because it can be um a path for those people who live farther in those rural settings in those urban markets so um you know we have we have the luxury of being able to think through those challenges because we're in both markets so it's exciting 
And does that change your planning at all as you think about the, you know, the, the Jetsons of the future type hospital? I mean, what does, what does it look like uh, to say um, you're going you're gonna to design George Jetson's hospital? Uh, how, do you, how do you think about planning and integrate you know, the crosswalk, what that you know, Star Trek vision or future sci-fi vision might look like versus what we actually are, are, are needing to build today and the capacity that we need to have to be able to do that? It's, it's a real struggle because, you know, that version of the future is potentially unrecognizable to us. And the care delivery is changing so fast. And yet our facilities and our assets take years and years to plan. And then they're, you know, consistently used for the next 50 years. So it's, it's a real um, disconnect. Yeah, I think that's an ongoing, uh, you know, process uh, with that. And then the last question that's kind of popped up here from uh, from LinkedIn is is around uh, geriatrics. I mean, we obviously have an aging population uh, that we're working to to try and manage. Uh, how does that how does that change the types of facilities that uh, you're thinking about as you look at the spectrum of of planning going forward? And um, what what do we need in the communities as we think about Alzheimer's and dementia and you know neurocognitive diseases uh, moving forward and the other and the unique needs of a senior population that oftentimes have more complex uh, medical issues? I think that's a great question. I, I think we all uh, resonate with um, older populations, especially as we think about our parents aging and and. Um, I think for, for me personally, I think it's around creating environments where people don't feel alone, especially if they don't have family members and the ability to, to be in community as they age. And also, what is the path for recovery when they come out of the hospital? What does that look like? Um, because it doesn't stop just after you get treated, right? There's an entire recovery path for you by which you you know are, are working on your personal health beyond just the, the procedure or the the treatment you got in one location. And so I think moving forward for us as an organization, it's about really um, aligning with that full continuum of health and engaging the other members of a person's family to support them in that in that in that journey as they age. And it's a real, I think it's a it's a real serious um, conversation as as an organization for us to invest in and make sure that we're there for those families and patients. And as we uh, come to the end of our, our time here, I'm just curious, and a final thought or reflection as, you know, obviously we have a multitude of, of stakeholders, you know, potentially who are, uh, you know, kind of watching this, uh, this feed for us today. And, and, you know, so as you think about, you know, you know, our architecture and design and, and construction and development partners that are out there, as well as, you know, folks who are you know, potentially uh, in cities and municipalities and other planning sorts of, of functions. And then also our internal clinicians and, and caregivers that are uh, part of our teams within Providence. Um, what do you want people to walk away from an understanding of what it means to do planning? What is what is that? What does you know master planning mean at, at a you know that biggest piece? If you said, here's the nugget you want those people to understand about who we are and what we do. That's a huge question. <laughs> I mean, I would say affordability. I think at this point, you know, I need a plan that I can implement and that I can afford. And designing the most beautiful thing that. Um, cannot be implemented is not a very good plan. So to just really understanding the financials of what we're, of what we're providing um, so that we can implement it is, is the key for me. I would probably say, you know, this isn't the next three years. This is something master planning is decades long. It's really pushing people to think very, very differently than they would today. And that, that's part of our job and what we get excited about. Yeah. Suzanne, any final thoughts I about what, uh, what you said. plan? Sorry, John, I think we spoke at the same time. Go ahead. No, I was going to say final thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was starting to say, I um, kind of dovetailing on what Michelle said, it's that abstract long-term thinking that can sometimes be really hard to communicate. Um, what is that vision? And it's like Hillary alluded to earlier, sometimes it's very different from how it looks today. And that can be 
that can be hard to um, disseminate that type of information. And um, we really are planning decades into the future. So um, the physical environment will change along with the delivery of care and all sorts of other things um, drastically within in that you know 20 year time period, let's say. Yeah, so I appreciate the, the time we're at the end of our uh, our session here today. But I think you know what, hopefully we've touched on a little bit uh, for those of you who are out there uh, watching this uh, discussion, and we will continue to unpack further in future uh, uh, live stream events. Is you know the fact that uh, real estate strategy and operations within Providence is a, a core strategic thinking partner for all of our, our our regions, for our ministries, for the caregivers that we have internally, as well as a resource potentially for uh, external stakeholders and partners that you know as a city or as a developer is looking at what should we be doing with a, with a particular um, area of the community or a particular parcel of land that uh, we are a partner that can help you set, uh, kind of think through those uh, those processes and to, and to understand um, how how you align ultimately the, the future of clinical strategy, the, the future of care delivery within the, the needs within a community. And that's the, the part that this team really works on, you know, day in and day out is trying to understand that intersection uh, between the built environment, care delivery and community need. And to really try to be able to uh, uh, understand where we are going forward. And so really appreciate all three of you this afternoon uh, being able to take some time and, and uh, join us uh, with this. I think this has been a really important topic uh, for dialogue. And like I said, this is the first of several uh, pieces for us to be able to move forward with that. I appreciate everyone out there joining us uh, in this conversation. Hopefully it's been somewhat uh, uh, entertaining, if not informative uh, along the way. And so if you want to learn more about the initiatives that Providence has as an organization, organization across all of our communities, or if you're looking uh, for medical care uh, in our communities, I invite you to, to uh, go to providence.org and be able to find uh, our facilities, our, our, our providers in your local communities. And then make sure, please, to follow us on social media. Um, Providence Health Systems, we're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, also on Twitter. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, see our um, our streams there with lots of great uh, uh, overall health information. So with that, thanks everyone. Appreciate the time today. Have a great afternoon. Take care. Thank you.